And in the process, I was frustrated that I didn't know how to do some of the things that I was expected to know, you know, as a full-time employee. And then I, I reflected on it and I said, why is this not required for kids? Why is this not required for college students to actually learn about just being, you know, savvy with their money, learning how to manage their money? So for me, I, I, instead of complaining, I just decided to, you know, be a part of the solution to the problem and, and instead of just highlighting the problem and doing nothing about it. So. On the Ball Podcast. What's going on, ballers? And welcome to another episode of the Beyond the Ball podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones, and the focus of Beyond the Ball is ultimately focusing on stories, strategies, and successes to help student athletes succeed beyond their degree. And if you all have not subscribed, I want to encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel because there we have exclusive video content as well as podcast episodes. So make sure to subscribe and don't miss any of those updates but now we're going to go ahead and dive into our guest today and our, our, our guest is, is a phenomenal individual who we happen to find these interesting and very cutting edge individuals so our, our guest today she is a speaker she's an author and she's an athlete development professional i'm going to go ahead and welcome to the beyond the ball podcast miss kiara mcclendon how are we hello. doing kiara? hello hello how are you thank you for having me Oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Glad glad to have you on. Glad to have you on. So go, go ahead. Just just take a moment and just share a little bit about the work that you do and just give people like a snapshot because I know I didn't cover it. So please go ahead. Take this time and, and, and go ahead and dive in. OK, sure. So uh, again, thank you for having me today on Beyond the Ball. I love your podcast and all the things that you're doing. So I'll shout out to you for that. Um, to share a little bit more about me. So my name is Kiara McClendon, as you mentioned, and um, I am the owner of a small business called A for Effort LLC, as well as I started an athlete development and financial literacy program called Exceptional Athlete. So financial literacy, athlete development are two things that I'm super passionate about. Um, and I try to be innovative in the approach to how we support our student athletes in those spaces. So that's the first thing. Um, second thing is I'm an author, so I actually have published two children's books under my book series called The Adventures of the Money Mavens. So again, an extension of that financial literacy um, education for young kids. It starts as early as kindergarten uh, and goes all the way up to our flashcards, which are age appropriate for adults, actually. Um, well, children ages 12 and up through to to adulthood. And then the last piece is I've been working in college athletics for about six years now in a variety of capacities, um, being a mentor to student athletes. So my focus has been ath excuse me, athletic development as well as the academic development of our student athletes. Um, so all of those things, my main theme has really been how do I mentor, support, uplift, and inspire um, the next generation of leaders who are student athletes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I really love just just the the fact of how how passionate you are about financial literacy, right? And and, and ultimately educating, equipping. And I mean, I've I've even hopped in on some talks where you were you you were sharing some stats just about across the country. Why isn't this topic being taken more serious? So, uh, just Kiara, how did you dive into the, why why did this become so so relevant and, and why did this become an area that that you saw needed to be be a solution? Sure. So, well, I can first talk about just my experiences and like my upbringing. So, I have a one of my grandparents. My grandmother was actually um, a very successful like bank manager um, back in my hometown. So, she was with the bank that she was with through four mergers into four different banks. So went from collective to fleet to summit to Bank of America. So when we see Bank of America now, those are all the banks that it was before that. So she had been in the banking industry for a number of years. I've been in the bank, been around that environment, um, but yet and still never had formal education on just the importance of money. I remember having maybe one unit in my fifth grade class, which shout out to my teacher, Mr. Elder. He did an excellent job of trying to expand our mindsets to different things. Um, we, we wrote checks and did like deposit slips. So I was aware of that. But again, still never being required to take, you know, classes on the subject. Now, fast forward, 
I have two master's degrees, so I went to school for quite a long time, racked mm. up quite a bit of debt <laughs> in the <laughs> process. And during that process, still no formal education on arguably one of the most important um, uh, tools, if you will, that we have to use to make decisions, which is money, right? Mm. So for me, when I became a professional, I started to go through the process of just planning my life, planning my retirement, like figuring out my salary and how I can manage my personal lifestyle. And in the process, I was frustrated that I didn't know how to do some of the things that I was expected to know, you know, as a full time employee. And then I, I reflected on it and I said, why is this not required for kids? Why is this not required for college students to actually learn about just being, you know, savvy with their money, learning how to manage their money? So for me, I, I, instead of complaining, I just decided to you know, be a part of the solution to the problem and, and instead of just highlighting the problem and doing nothing about it. So I took all of those experiences. I started to educate myself, taking some classes, reading some books, and then really learning by doing. So I made some mistakes along the way, but I feel like that characterizes my ability to just share my experience with, with the student athletes and the people that I serve. Yeah. So if there's somebody out there who, they're, like they're in square one right now, they, they don't know what they should be doing just in regards to starting their, their financial literacy journey or, or, or furthering their, their knowledge in this subject. Like what, like, is there a one, two, three, or, or is there something that, that you can provide people to help them like just get started in this development process? Sure. I mean, I think the simplest thing, the simplest ways to start out with your financial literacy journey is one, we have to examine your mindset as it relates to money, right? So I think a lot of us spend a lot of time um, thinking about money in a scarce with a scarcity mindset, like I don't have enough, or there's not enough, or I'm in competition with others for money. When in actuality, you're really in competition with yourself, and the opportunities that you create for yourself allow you to create opportunities to make more money. Whether that be through pursuing, you know, a different career path or your, you know, different opportunities. Whether it be investing, whether it be whatever that your avenue is for creating that you know, um, stability for yourself, I would say, first and foremost, look at that. Get rid of the scarcity mindset. Look at money as a tool for access and an abundant resource for you to get to where you want to go. So that's number one. <laughs> number two, if we're talking about practicality, creating a budget. Everybody has some type of money at some point in time, unless you're just not able to work at this moment. So whether you get you know, $500 a week, $5,000 a week, $50,000 a week, the biggest thing is, how do I look at the money that I'm bringing in and maximize the use of that money? How do I make sure that the things that I want are taken care of second and the things that I need are taken care of first? I cannot get the things that I want before taking care of the things that I need. So I would say those are the two biggest things to start out with your mindset and then building the budget and really examining how to make the money that you're currently bringing in work for you before we even talk about adding additional streams of income and all that good stuff. Ah, uh, Kiara, you stepping on my toes. You stepping on my toes. Sometimes <laughs> I just want what I want. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes I just want to, you know, I, 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 you know, Tuesday, I might want sushi. I might not want to look at the budget. I might just want to go get sushi. Hey, listen, you can do that, <laughs> but then you not you get sushi today and then miss out on a bill tomorrow. <laughs> you know, people just have to be careful. And, and one thing that people have, I guess, mistaken as it relates to budgeting is that we're saying you can never have things that you want. Mm. In actuality, a budget makes it so much easier for you to get the things that you want and still save for things that you need in the future or want in the future. If you follow, it's a, it's a common rule, but if you follow the 50, 30, 20 rule, 50% of your after taxes, after deduction income is supposed to go to the things that you need, right? 30% is allocated to the things that you want. 20% is allocated to the things that you are saving for. So that 30%, you can get the sushi in there if you're smart with how you use that 30%, you know? Dang, you're going to come through here and drop the extra, going to give, give us the bonus bar. Golly, man, I, I, I can't say, I don't think I've ever heard of it. Put like, Can you say that one more time? So 50, 30, 20, 50% goes to needs, 30% goes to wants, 20% goes to savings. So, and then the 20% really should be paid to you first. So when you get your paycheck, that 20% should automatically go to your savings. Then you take the other 80%. And like I said, split it into 50, take care of your needs first. 
and then splitting the 30, taking care of the stuff that you want. Man. Wow, that's pretty cool over there. Cause it looked like you was cutting up a pie as you were getting into the equation. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that that's 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 pretty cool. That, that's pretty cool. So as as you said something about like a scarcity mindset, I think, and 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 this is this is gonna be this is gonna be a general statement, but but I feel that looking at some some peoples in certain cultures, you know, that that it might look like might look like a culture that 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 me and you might might be a part of, and and understanding that money sometimes has an association of well well for, first the, the association of of money with with status right mm -hmm. and then on the other side of that like i think anybody can teach about money right like money in anybody who has taken the time to study and learn but at the same time there's a level of relatability that i don't think that everybody carries why are you so relatable just just when it comes to you know doing the work that you do like you know partnering with colleges universities and and, and even you know partnering with, with with athletes like like talk talk just a little bit about that and you know why, why you're so good at what you do okay so first i want to touch on the status piece as it relates to money so we know college athletics professional athletics or any any arm of entertainment is big business right it's a lot of money that comes in and there's a lot of money that goes out and <laughs> That's one of even more of a significant reason why it's important to teach the athletes how to manage their money, because they're in a lot of cases, the avenue by which these fields make their money. Like the, if, if college athletes weren't competing, colleges wouldn't have money. College athletics programs wouldn't have money. Same for professional sports. But yet and still, I think we you again, it's 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 awesome to be rich, but it's even more impactful to be wealthy. And when we get caught up in chasing money and, and, and showing off our money for status purposes, that's a rich mindset. I don't want to be rich. I want to be wealthy because mm -hmm. that building of wealth sets me up to be successful, but also the generations that come after me. And when we talk about changing the narrative, changing the mindset, being wealthy is actually more other centered, if you think about it, based on what I just mm -hmm. said. Because it's about making sure that the generations that come after you are set up. Being rich is me flashing or being flashy for the people around me who, to be quite honest, like they may not have as much money as me or they may have completely different habits that don't ascribe to the same beliefs that I do. So I'm not worried about being flashy and being rich for them or, or showing off my riches for them. I'm worried about that next generation. And that's what we have to make sure that we're instilling in our athletes. Um, the other piece as it relates to the relatability um, I've worked in college athletics for six years, as I mentioned, on the side of academic um, achievement as well as student athlete development. So I work with athletes on how they learn. How do you dissect information um, mm -hmm. coming from the high school environment to the college environment? How can I make sure you know how to maximize your time, study, um, take advantage of the on-campus resources, connect with professors, dissect your syllabi, actually learn and study this content. So that's one. So I already know that. Then the athlete development side is how do we put together programming that's effective for our student athletes, that's relevant, that's fun, that's engaging, that, you know, has a cultural tie to who they are. And I'm also a young professional still in my career. Yes, I've been in college athletics for the years that I mentioned, but I'm not quite 15, 20 years removed from, you know, you know, certain college and so on and so forth. So like for me, some of the music that they listen to, not all of it, because some of it's a little crazy, but <laughs> I still listen to it, you know, or or some of the programs on TV, some of the podcasts and things like that I relate to. So I'm able to take a teacher's mindset an athlete development mindset and then a a cultural awareness and put it all together and then deliver the financial literacy education because I know what I'm talking about. So I think that's huge. And there have to there has to be more black and brown individuals in this space mm. talking to athletes when we know that a large majority of the athlete groups that we're discussing are black and brown individuals. Mm. Wow. Talk talk more about that. Why why is that why is that so important just, just from a holistic perspective to learn from somebody who looks more like you or learn from somebody who has similar experiences as you? Why why, why is that so important? I think that from a theory perspective, I, and there's like educational theories that go over this, but they I'll take it there for a second. So 
there are a number of studies that talk about how um, students that have an African-American teacher that are African-American identifying or black identifying students are more successful in school because mm -hmm. they identify with their teacher or their teacher looks like them or has that cultural competence, that cultural awareness, that understanding, and the student identifies with that person. So their drive to be successful is also attached to some identifier that they have with this person that is their educator, right? That same thing is the case for when we're talking about educating student athletes or college students or even professional athletes. Then on top of that, um, there's another podcast that I watched and part of that episode, they were talking about how the finance industry specifically is very much so quota based. Um, you know, financial professionals, financial advisors are trying to get these athletes, these big money clients mm -hmm. in there, sign them, manage their money and don't always know or understand what is the priority of that particular athlete. Like talking to a client whose parents have been wealthy in the past, that conversation is totally different than a first generation millionaire than a person that's never had more than, you know, $5,000 at a time and, and, and now has signed a contract for 50 million or five million or whatever it is. So in that, I think it's important for us to be conscious of that, like having people that are in the industry, whether it's the education side, the financial advising side, agents, whatever, that are like, I've been where you've been. I've seen what you've seen, or I can identify with the things that you identify with because we have a shared experience in some way, shape, or form. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. I, I never even thought about it like that. J just in regards to you know the the quota, and ultimately that that a client is more so a, a client could potentially be be more so a number versus being an individual. Mm -hmm. But that's call it. Mm, this is gonna be a little controversial here. That's college athletics in general, like there's however many hundreds of thousands of kids, maybe even millions of kids every year that's trying to get a spot, right? Mm -hmm. Their opportunities to get on a division one program, more specifically a power five spot, whether it's football, basketball, et cetera, or any other sport are very, very slim. That same slim chance, and, and I'm not saying numbers because to be honest, I don't know all of the numbers, but the same scarcity of spot or scarcity of opportunity exists at the pro level. We just were talking about how the WNBA this year has a large number of um, college athletes that have declared for the WNBA draft. They only have 12 teams, 12 spots, 144 spots, right? But I think they said it was what, like 500? or I, Maybe I made that number up, but it was a large number of students, again, looking for that opportunity. So I think that's also important to be just mindful of that like the industries that we're in operate off of that I don't want to say elitism but just this idea that like there's only one spot there's only one opportunity there's only this one thing and and I think unfortunately college athletics can can sometimes create that unhealthy relationship with that with that mm -hmm. mindset yeah. And then even and, and then I, I'll just add to the conversation, because even if, you know, an individual declare or, or a young lady declares for the you know WNBA, one 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 benefit that there is if they don't happen to make the team in the WNBA, that there are some that there are deals overseas and then they actually could generate more money, potentially more money in some of these uh, some of these countries for some of these teams. But at the same time, you're, you're giving up a lot in order to make yeah. that dream a reality right you're, yeah. you're 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 going clear across the world you're 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 going to be more so by yourself you might be the only american but it's it's yeah. just i think it's just one of those things where you know there, there's a few different sides of the coin and it just depends on everybody's situation <sighs> yeah I, i'll say this and I'm, I'm definitely not knocking the wmba mm -hmm. or like the you know the teams i think that the organization is amazing. I think we need to see more support for the WNBA, for women's sports specifically, because just this past women's final four, women's tournament, like those athletes, the, the female athletes that were playing were balling. Do you hear me? Like I've paid more attention to their tournament, no offense to the guys, but then I really did the guys tournament because of all of the last minute victories, last minute mm -hmm. buzzer beaters, all of that. And those same athletes are going to be the ones that go into the WNBA or go play overseas. So I just want to see any athlete 
male, female identifying or other identifying be able to be successful in their space. But specifically when I speak to, you know, the aspirations to go pro in the NBA, WNBA, I just am calling attention to the fact that there aren't that many spots. Going overseas is an awesome opportunity, but not everybody's always as open to that at first anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, I mean, since you brought up the 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 the, the women's tournament, I got to bring it up as well. Uh, so one one thing I heard, I mean, I, I went I went in and I looked, and it the stats showed that women the 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 women's tournament ultimately like the ratings, like the followings, the the most followed players were on the women's side, right? Yeah, which I think set I, I think really says a lot about just us understanding that we do need to put more support there. We do need to put more attention there. And that's why, I mean, I, like I saw the new WNBA jerseys. I think, I think those are really amazing. Yeah. And I think it'd be, I think it'd be pretty cool. You know, see, see some guys wearing some jerseys. Hey, you know yes. Yes. I think women athletes, women's sports athletes, more specifically WNBA athletes, and even like the women's soccer, they mm -hmm. have always been vocal about their support for their male counterparts or male um, athletes in other leagues and slowly but surely we're starting to see it um unfortunately like and god rest his soul like kobe was doing a lot in that space as mm -hmm. it related to supporting women's basketball but i'd love to see more athletes speak out in favor or in support of what they're doing and, and put some money behind it really mm -hmm. because the opportunities we need them. The exposure, we need them. But one of the biggest disparities for them is the lack of funds um, that are being allocated both at the college level and professional level for, for women's basketball. That same um, thing that you mentioned, you saw ratings as to the most popular athletes. I think I saw a, a meme on Instagram that broke down potential earnings. And mm -hmm. like, I don't know if it was 20 athletes or the top 20 or whatever, but like half of them were female basketball players and the other half were male basketball players. And I think the top two or three were actually female college basketball players. So projected earnings as it relates to name, image, and likeness also position them at a higher level. So we need to respect them, like put some respect on their name, put some money behind and support behind, behind what they're doing. And, and hopefully this past tournament has sh shaken things up a little bit. And, and just put people on notice and hopefully we don't have too many more ignorant comments like I've seen from some of these athletes because some people made some very ignorant statements. I won't I won't I won't name no names, but that, you know, they need some some education and some support um, so that they can be better allies. Yeah, I saw that tweet. I, I, I saw that tweet out there. I said, mm -hmm. oh, my goodness, he they can't be serious. Right. Oh, they can't. So we're going, we're going, we're going to pivot. We're going to pivot. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I, I want, I want to ask you this. Cause I was, I was looking at something, uh, just the other day, not, I was looking at something, but I was just, just looking at how the, the scope has shifted because when, when you and I were growing up, rappers were talking about money. Mm -hmm. They were talking about maybe drugs and mm -hmm. a few other things. Mm -hmm. Now, the conversation has shifted for rappers are talking about credit. They're still talking about money, but they're talking about investing mm -hmm. there. Some of them are, are business owners mm -hmm. and talk, just, just, just talk to me. Am, am I tripping or has, has there been a paradigm shift in just the conversation that that's taking place or a cultural shift? Yeah. I mean, I think we, I've definitely seen, and, and shout out to younger rappers that are doing it too. Like he's pretty quiet for the most part when it comes to a lot of his interviews, but like Roddy Rich did an interview. He sat down with, um, and I, I don't know what platform, but he talked about that, like being a young rapper, like going back into his hood and, and buying a home there and saying, I did it intentionally because mm -hmm. I wanted people to see, you know, what it is that I'm doing. And he was inspired by Nipsey, who is a huge inspiration for me. I can I could have a whole conversation just about Nipsey alone. But again, people like him, people like Jay Z. Obviously, when he put out um, his album, and and um, I, I'm forgetting the name of the song, but and I can't sing the lyrics because they're pretty pretty explicit. But he says, you know, at one point he says like, "What's more important than doing X, Y, and Z? Credit." And like he talks about like 
owning the Basquiat painting and owning all of these other assets and them appreciating and value. And I think at that time, that was the first time that we heard people really paying attention to rappers singing about building wealth. Rick Ross talks about buying back the block all the time. Like, and, and that's amazing. Um, I also think the reason why that's happening is because rappers are starting to wake up or at least converse amongst themselves about the fact that rapping's also a finite industry. Like you're not going to be a rapper forever, like a Nas or like a Jay Z. Like mm. the longevity and careers for rappers right now is you got a hot song, you ride that wave until the song's not hot anymore, and then you know you typically some people can keep going and 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 some people can't. You know, so I think that also plays a role into maybe why we see that paradigm shift or that cultural shift within the entertainment industry. They see that rapping. And being a ball player or playing sports are very similar because right now, as as black and brown people, we don't own any of that. Mm. <laughs> we don't own either industry, a majority stake in either industry. So I think now, it, it, you know, it's important that we're saying, how can we how can we change the narrative? How can we become owners of our own destiny, our own legacy? So, yeah. Wow. Owners of our own destiny and our own legacy that's that's a bar Ooh, wow so you saying that I, the first thought that just comes to mind is just name image and likeness we don't have to go there i'm just saying it just, we, can it, go it, there. It, <laughs> we can go there <laughs> oh i mean i don't i don't even i don't even <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm not gonna say i don't like talking about the conversation mm -hmm. my biggest thing is i'm more so waiting for the first drop of it to take place the first drop of the legislation to happen across the country and then we're going to see like what can be done what could be done what should be done and 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 the reason the, the reason i'm thinking of it now initially the reason i'm thinking of it now is for one just like what you're saying march madness has passed Paige beckers that's mm -hmm. that's her last name is Be beckers beckers so I, th I think so too. I hope I'm not I'm not butchering it. Hey, if you see this, if you see this, forgive us. Right. <laughs> she she's out the gate with 380,000 followers on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Then we then we go and we talk Sarah Sarah Fuller. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how many followers she has, but when she had the push and she had the wisdom and the insight to put um, you know, the the website in her in her Instagram bio. And I'm just the first thought I have is potential missed opportunity for them because, you know, Pe Paige Becker, I believe, was was player player of the player of the year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And duplicating that is is something that's difficult. And then on the other side, I'm thinking about some of these young men from Last Chance U. Yeah. Watching them go and 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 I and I actually and I actually interviewed Deshaun. But watching him go from like 5,000 followers to like 180,000, 120,000. Right. And can't monetize that right now. Can't my and, and I was talking with him. He was like, yeah, it's, it, it's just eyes. At, at this point, it's, it, it's, it's just eyes. They can, right. be, they can look. It's right. eyes. And I was like. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm kicking it to you. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just talking. Well, first and foremost, I want to say, and I, I need to do a better job of paying attention to how this has worked in the NAIA because mm. Nathan Likeness has passed in the NAIA and there's actually a young woman and I, I wish I knew her name. I read the article about it, but I don't have her name offhand. She's a women's gymnastics uh, student athlete and she already started to monetize mm -hmm. um, one of her businesses. So I think being intentional and looking at the smaller instances where this is already happening and seeing what's worked for them and what hasn't. Like we haven't heard that the NAIA as a whole organization or a whole like unit is folding. So it's fine. It can be done and it can be done successfully and kinks can be worked out. Um, I think the struggle right now is you got states competing with, you know, the NCAA's potential legislation and then some federal things on top of that that are really holding up the progress of just the passage of name, image, and likeness um, more immediately, you know, like by 2025, <laughs> the athletes that I'm talking to right now, you know, not going to be in school anymore, you know, no more. And, and so that, that doesn't help them. So we've started these conversations, but 
are we really talking about waiting till 2025 to pay them in some capacity or just allow them to monetize their own platforms? I think that's awful. And by that time, just imagine how much more college athletics is going to be worth. Sports is going to be worth. I know in some places like sports betting is becoming legal where it wasn't legal before. So like, just think about all this other money that, you know, is, is, uh, is coming into the sports arena and still athletes, still college athletes not being paid um, or allowed to, to monetize their platform. So to your point, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I've always stood by the fact that student, student athletes should be paid. Even when people were like, oh my God, do you believe that? <laughs> like, yes, I do. Because I've been at an athletic program that was valued to be worth a billion dollars. Mm. <laughs> and to me, I'm looking at it like they're worth a billion dollars based on the effort of maybe what, 25 guys mm. off and on based on first, second, third string, you know. Wow. Even though their rosters a hundred plus, you know that interchangeably you got your star players, and typically those are the so off of them, and they don't see a dime. Like you still have students that are sending money home to their parents from their cost of attendance checks or using Pell Grant money that should really be used for them to be able to finance their education, pay their rent, whatever, eat, you know, beyond the facility, and, and they're not able to do that. So it's bigger than just, you know setting them up to be successful entrepreneurs or 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 to 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 be able to to make money from a from a work perspective I just want to make sure they can they can eat they're not missing any meals wow man Kiara I'm I'm gonna have to bring you back on or something we're gonna gonna dive a little bit deeper into this and just talk you know just 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 talk more more about this and you know just just even just even talk talk about you know updates and and different things like that because i know you're always on the go you always you you always have have something going on on your side but before i let you go before i let you go i gotta i i gotta run you through i gotta run you through the two minute drill okay and 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 the two minute drill is just when i'm gonna ask you a few rapid fire questions i actually didn't tell you this before but i'm gonna ask you you a few rapid fire questions and it's just gonna give people to see a different side of you have a little bit of fun so are you ready i think so yeah i'm ready let's go let's go you think you think so (laughs) let's do it let's do it okay okay here we go favorite food oh ice cream (laughs) that's awful but ice cream ice cream which one so I'm actually a vegan, so I like vegan ice cream. Like Ben and Jerry's has this like crazy vegan flavor that's like cookie dough, something, something is great. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, what, what's what's the last book you read? Mm, so I started to, I'm reading two books at the same time, The Five Love Languages and The Seven, the seven Successful Laws of Spirituality. It's a Deepak Chopra book. I'm listening to both of them on audiobook. Okay. Uh, what's what, what's your favorite podcast? Yours. <laughs> I, don't, I don't put that in there to set people up. I, I really put it out there to ask people. Like, if you have a different one, you could say that. I'm not. It wasn't like a setup. Sure. So I mean, I I definitely think yours is dope. I have my own like Instagram live series that I do on a weekly basis called Cash Rolls with Kiara. So I don't consider that a podcast, but informationally, it would be similar to that. And then obviously, everybody's in love with the I Am Athlete, I Am Woman podcast right now. So I love I love those as well. Definitely, definitely, and you know we you know we got to get you on the on the podcast way. But anyway, uh, what, what what would be your go to uh, streaming show of preference? Hmm, like Netflix kind of streaming. Sure, sure, Netflix. Hmm. I mean, we we I think we kind of mentioned Last Chance You. So every time they have a new season, I'm always on that. Um. Yeah, let's just go with that for right now. Last Chance You. Gotcha. And then what, what's what's one tip that you want to leave for a student athlete? What's one tip? Mm, that's hard. But I think just everything that is going on in your life right now seems so big and daunting and like you have to have everything all together right now. And the most important thing that I want student athletes to know is like take your life, take your progress, take your growth one day one step at a time you don't have to have everything all figured out right now solid 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 and then last thing i want to ask just just as bonus this is just bonus question uh but who would you like to see me interview 
next on Beyond the Ball? Hmm. I don't know if he'll do it because he's a pretty quiet guy, but you should reach out to Prince, Prince Moody. Um, he's the assistant director of student athlete engagement um, at Ohio State, and he's done a lot of great things um, with their student athlete development programming there. So he's a great guy, um, real vibrant. He's always everywhere, knows everybody. I call him the connector, so he'd be another really good person to connect with. Okay, dope, dope, dope. So, so Kiara, thank you for you know taking time and, and rocking with us here uh, at Beyond the Ball, and uh, you know sharing your sharing your message, uh, just sharing what you do uh, with the ballers out there. Oh, but now at this time, just share where people, just share where would be the best place for people to connect with you, and then also you know just letting people know about some of the services you offer. Please do that at this time. Sure. So, um, if you want to connect with me personally on social media, follow me at Kiara K I A. A R A I M. Um, and then you also can check out my business page for Exceptional Athlete, which is the athlete development financial literacy program that I mentioned. If anybody's looking for a financial literacy guest speaker for like your summer bridge programs, any sports organizations, um, or other athlete development uh, programming that you have, please reach out to me. Um, April is financial literacy month. So the more that I can do in this month and the months that follow, the, the, the better. And then if you're if you got kids and you're looking to start your financial literacy journey with them, check out my website, which is moneymavenscrew.com. Um, and the Adventures of the Money Mavens, as I said, it's a coloring book series that helps to educate children on just the basics related to financial literacy. So got a lot of places. If you missed any of that, just connect with me on Instagram at Kiara I am. And all of that information is um, in my bio. Dope, dope, dope. Well, uh, once again, like, like I said, thank you so much, Kiara, for, for hanging out with us and rocking with us and, thank and, you. And, and, and adding value as, as I know you do really well. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been great. Dope, dope, dope. Everybody out there, everybody out there listening, all, all the ballers out there listening, uh, I want to encourage you all, where, whenever, wherever you're listening to this episode, whenever you listen to it, uh, be sure to take a screenshot. And then tag myself, tag Kiara on Instagram. You know, we'll, we'll reshare, we'll repost it. But let Kiara know what you took from the episode, right? Let, let her know what really stood out to you. Let her know what really hit home. And then click that link in her bio and then make a purchase, right? Make a purchase, make a purchase. So uh, everybody, thanks again for rocking. Uh, I'm Jonathan Jones, and this is Beyond the Ball, where we help you succeed beyond your degree.